Good morning and welcome once again to uh, the Sunday morning service that comes from the Cornerstone Elim Church in Silverdale. I mentioned that we're an Elim Church, we're a, a family of churches, a group of churches, a movement. Uh, and during this week, there has been a lot of focus on prayer. We've had three days where we've encouraged people to pray and to fast and to seek God's face. And during this time, we've also encouraged people to pray the Lord's Prayer. And so right at the beginning of our service, I want to pray that Lord's Prayer. I want to encourage you to pray with me. And uh, when we get to the end of it, I'll just uh, continue praying just for a short while. So let's say the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. God, we thank you that you are our father. We thank you that you have adopted us. You brought us into your family. We thank you that we can be sons and daughters of the living God. You are a good father. You're a holy father, but we thank you, God, that uh, the mess in our lives, it has all been dealt with through Jesus Christ. You gave your son because you wanted us to share in your family. Our father, we thank you that uh, you are a king uh, and we pray for your kingdom to come. We pray that uh, through prayer, we will discern your will, how it is you want to live and reign in our lives and in our church and in our community. And we pray that we will see God breaking in in a new way and in a fresh way and in a, in a dynamic way. We thank you that you are the provider. And Lord, we are aware that there are so many people at the moment in financial difficulty, some losing jobs, some uncertain of their jobs. Uh, but Father, we do thank you for the truth of the Bible uses this name, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider. And we pray that we shall discover your abundant and miraculous provision for ourselves. Thank you that you are a protector. We pray for protection against the evil God uh, and all its consequences. And obviously paramount foremost in our thoughts is COVID-19 God. God, will you please protect us, protect our families, protect our church, protect our community, protect our nation, and indeed just break through in this world. Although uh, all the scientific evidence seems to say uh, that uh, we're gonna have a second surge and things seem to be getting worse. We thank you that you are greater. And so we do pray that you will intervene because uh, just as the, the prayer, the Lord's prayer, the disciples prayer ends with the fact that yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory. We thank you that you're a powerful God. So please God, will you intervene here? And thank you that you are an eternal God. Yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. And God, we bless you that you have been God from eternity past to eternity future. And that your plan, your destiny for each and every one of us is to share in that eternity with you. So we give you glory. Thank you that you hear our petitions. Uh, thank you as well that you answer prayer. Amen. God bless you. King of kings, majesty.
Hello friends. I've recently become a grandmother for the third time. My daughter Jamie gave birth to Archie George on the 27th of August. He's three weeks old already. Jamie had a miscarriage last year. So when she found out she was expecting again, we were very cautiously thrilled about the news. But as time progressed and the pregnancy progressed without apparent problem, we got really excited for his arrival. <coughs> However, at one of her later scans, it was clear that the baby was in the breech position. At that stage, they weren't particularly concerned about it, and she had another scan two weeks later, and he was still in the breech position. This time, the professionals told Jamie that they may have to intervene. Um, and to uh, and turn him physically in the womb. Obviously, this was a bit unsettling for Jamie. She didn't she didn't want to, the stress of that, but she didn't want the baby to be stressed because of it either. And she has always said that she if if it came to it that she would prefer to have a C-section rather than the baby to be in any distress. However, God proved Himself very faithful again, because His prayer request went onto the WhatsApp group. Uh, for prayer and God answered in a wonderful way when she went for a scan the next day she, the baby had turned it he must have turned overnight and it, that was God that was intervening for him so she was able to continue with her pregnancy without any problems however Archie George did not want to vacate the premises he was overdue and she was expecting them to be induced on the following Saturday However, on the Wednesday morning, she felt that Archie's movements in the room had reduced drastically. So she rang MAU and they told her to go to them to be monitored, which she did. Then the doctor decided then that Archie had not put on enough weight while he was in the room. He was not within the guidelines for... Um, uh, where he was in the pregnancy um, and what they required. So they decided to induce her that day instead of waiting till the Saturday. The treatments they gave her though for inducing her did not agree with the baby at all. They dropped his heartbeat quite, heartbeat quite drastically. So after the second treatment when it continued to drop his heartbeat they decided that he needed, she needed to have a cesarean section. Therefore, at 12.55am, Thursday the 27th of August, Archie George was born. He weighed 8 pounds. The doctor told Jamie he was underweight in the womb and he weighed 8 pounds. So that was a miracle as well. That was God intervening, intervening as well. Now these events may not seem very remarkable to some of you watching this, but as a grandmother, I say with the mother, Hannah, of one Samuel, for this child I prayed. I had three sons and a daughter who's my youngest. I have prayed before she was pregnant that I would see my grandchild, that she would have a baby that I could help and support her with and care for. For this child I prayed and God has been so faithful for me in this. As, as every newborn is, he is a miracle baby. I'm 62 now and I was afraid that I would just be too old to be able to take him for walks and things like this. But God, as I say, he has been so faithful. He has blessed me so much with this family. Every time I see him and I hold him, I can pray over him. I haven't been able to do that very much for my other grandchildren, but with this one, I can. And I tell you, the, the prayer, the power of a praying grandmother is mighty because nothing and no one will get to our grandchild, will they, grandparents? But I prayed over Archie when he was in the womb and I prayed the word of God that he spoke to, to Jeremiah. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. And I just knew that God was going to bring this child through. Whatever whatever the doctors and the midwives told Jamie, God was going to see this child born into this life. And I just thank God and I praise him every day for this child. And I just hope that 
this has um, made some sense to any of you. Thank you. Amen. family. I hope you're all okay. It's Sunday again. These weeks seem to be flying by, don't they? I'm just here to bring you a few announcements this morning and the first one I've been really looking forward to because you're going to see a beautiful picture. There you go. This is Hyden Atiemi's baby girl, Atonye Elora Kahuna. Hopefully I've pronounced that well. But Atonye is absolutely adorable. And on Wednesday this week, myself and Pastor Peter went round to Hajan uh house to do a baby naming ceremony, which I've never been part of before. 
that was very exciting. So some of their closest friends and family got to join in on Zoom as we dedicate these with the name Atonye Elora Saluni. And what a beautiful little service it was as well. But unfortunately, Hajj herself had to join the meeting from hospital on Zoom from the ward because she's not been feeling too good. So please do keep Hajj and the family in your prayers. And obviously for Simeon and Precious as well, now that they're big brothers, big responsibility. But please do keep the whole family in your prayers. But I thought you would love to see this picture of the most adorable Latonya. She really is gorgeous and a real blessing and a real miracle as well, which we're hoping that Hajj and Afiemi will share with us one of these weeks as well. So please keep them in your prayers and congratulations to them. Okay, and then second, it's a reminder that the 27th of September, that's just next week now, is our harvest service. And obviously we're still not meeting in the church building, but what we're asking you to do instead this year is to put together a little harvest package. Perhaps give to one of your elderly neighbours or someone who's in need that you know of and give them a little parcel. But please do make sure that everything's wrapped up because you know we're still trying to do what we can to get rid of this covid virus aren't we so make sure things are wrapped up and not loose please if you can but also if it's possible if you could make two parcels a second parcel we could give to one of the members of our church which we try and give out food every year don't we to some of our church members and it would be lovely if we can do that again this year and if you want to get in touch with me or Pastor Peter, if you're happy to do that, then we can let you know who would like to receive a parcel. And I've also got some little cards as well that you can include in with the parcel, which just says, please enjoy this harvest gift with love and blessings from your friends at Cornerstone Elam Church. We want to be a blessing at harvest time and all the time, don't we? So please do get in touch with us if you would like to get involved. Fantastic. And third notice for today, we now have access to part two of the life of Peter, which our good friend Mark Ryan from Birmingham City Church has shared with us. And it's something that you can use for personal devotional time. Or if your house groups are meeting six people to a house, socially distanced or still meeting over Zoom, then it's going to be a really good resource to use as part of your group. And we're going to have a dedicated page on the website for house groups as well. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, our website address is www.cornerstoneelamchurch.co.uk. But I'm sure all of you know that already. Yeah, <laughs> enjoy that one. And the final notice this morning as well. You can see there, we're just reminding you to keep upholding Pastor Ray Cotter in your prayers as he's doing a 50 mile sponsored walk to help raise funds to build a brand new church in Zimbabwe, which is going to dedicate in memory of our lovely Pastor Edwin. So if you can, if you need details of how to sponsor Ray, if you want to drop me an email to info at cornerstone elim church, or one word, all over case, .co.uk, then send me an email and I can send you the details. Some of you will know that you've probably already had those details. If you haven't had them, that means I haven't got your email address and can't send you any info. So please do get in touch if you want to start receiving emails and need any more information. Well, thank you for listening to the notices today. I hope you enjoy the service and that you have a super blessed week. God bless you. Bye-bye.
Good morning again, and uh, we're going to carry on this morning with uh, a new series on uh, Nehemiah, which we actually began last week. And if you have got access to a Bible and you could, you're able to find the book of Nehemiah, that would be great. It's not that easy to find. Uh, it's roughly in the middle of the Old Testament. If you find the book of Psalms and work back a couple of uh, books, you'll find Nehemiah there. I was mentioning last week that although um, the book of, the, of Nehemiah is in the middle of the Old Testament, as far as the history, the timing, the chronology is concerned, it actually consider, uh, contains and reports about events that took place right at the end of Old Testament history. Sadly, God's people had disobeyed him, and God had warned them that they, he would take them away from their land, away from the promised land, and uh, they would be taken into exile, they would become slaves, and uh, they would have to learn to trust God again. And that took place, and during this time, the temple was destroyed and the people were taken away to Babylon. After 70 years, God allowed them to come back and they started rebuilding the temple. Um, there was a few problems, but eventually the temple got rebuilt. And uh, Nehemiah, as I said, it's right at the end of the Old Testament. And uh, Nehemiah is not in Jerusalem. Nehemiah is hundreds of miles away in a place called Susa. And uh, this was one of the capital cities of the mighty Persian Empire. And Nehemiah had this incredibly privileged position. He was the cupbearer to the king. And it was more than just being a glorified butler. He was almost the last line of defense if anyone ever tried to poison the king. And so he had this trusted, very responsible position, living in the lap of luxury, living in this enormous citadel, this enormous palace uh, there. Uh, but despite the fact that he was hundreds of miles away from Jerusalem, he was desperately concerned about the city. And one day some people had traveled to see him, and it was he, him, who initiated the question, what's going on with Jerusalem? What's going on with the city of God? What's going on with the people of God? What's going on with the work of God? And he is distressed to hear that although the temple has been built, the city walls have not been rebuilt. In fact, they've been broken down. The gates have been burned with fire. And uh, the enemies are encroaching in on Jerusalem. And uh, of course, in a, in a sense, Jerusalem is much more than a city. It sort of signifies the work of God that is under threat and that needs to be built up. And so in chapter one, we read that when uh, Nehemiah hears this, he weeps and prays and fasts. Um, it actually says for some days. I'll say a little bit more about that uh, in a minute. It was more than just for some days. And again, I want to encourage you, if you haven't looked at it, look at chapter one and see the contents of Nehemiah's prayer. He prays to the God of heaven. Uh, we begin the Lord's prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, in this position of power and authority, who sees what is going on, but is able to intervene. He prays to a God who is great, powerful, but also awesome. <laughs> Nehemiah's relationship with God affected his appreciation of who God was, and he realized what an awesome thing it was to come into the presence of God. It's a God who keeps his covenant of love, who makes promises, uh, with people who will listen to him, people will, who will obey him. And uh, Nehemiah first addresses God, then he talks about sin. He talks about, I confess the sins my father's house and I have made. He wasn't busy blaming other people. He wasn't busy saying, oh, I've got all this right. Uh, none of this is my fault. Uh, uh, instead, he said, God, you know, there's a problem there. And uh, if I'm going to be part of the answer, I want to repent for anything that I've done that has messed this up and uh, want you to use me. His prayer is full of knowledge of the word of God. Obviously, in those days, um, he primarily just probably had mainly just the first five books of the Bible, the law of Moses. But he said, look, these are the promises you made, God. You said, yes, you will discipline your people. But if your people turn to you and they seek you, that you will restore them, even from the ends of the earth, even the biggest problem that we could imagine, you are more than capable of dealing with uh, that. And then finally, at the end of his prayer, he says, give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man, in the presence of the king. 
And we find that Nehemiah says, I want to be involved. I'm not just going to sit on the side. I'm not going to throw stones. I'm not just going to be an observer. I want to be involved. Give me an opportunity in the presence of the king. So I want to pick up the story in chapter two. And let me just read in chapter two. It begins in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought to him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. So it starts off and it mentions this month of Nisan, which probably doesn't mean anything to us. It's that they're talking about the Jewish names for the months. And uh, this month of Nisan is roughly our sort of March, April. Um, interestingly, when you go back to chapter one, verse one, it says that when he had encountered the people who were telling him about the great uh, distress that Jerusalem was in, that was in the month of Kislev. Kislev is roughly December. So it seems to me that Nehemiah has been praying for three to four months because of his desperate concern. When he just says, oh, I wept and prayed and fasted for, for, for some days. Uh, this is concentrated. This is persistent prayer. During this week, um, Elim have had uh, a three, just three days of encouraging people to pray and fast. But let's have a heart for God. You know, if these things really matter to us, let's become men and women who are persistent in our prayer. And it seems to me that what has happened is as he is praying, he is getting more and more distressed. He is getting more and more anxious. He is waiting for God to intervene. And uh, actually, this has begun to affect his whole demeanor. Because we carry on and we read, it says, I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid. Now, I'll come back to that in a minute. Why was he afraid? The king is just asking, what's the matter? You're obviously very sad. But it says, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad where the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven. Now, we're not told exactly what he said. In actual fact, in Nehemiah, we find this uh, great mixture of the fact that he is a man who is persistent in prayer. You know, he's been praying for three, four months about this. And uh, I wonder what his prayer was. I, I just wonder if it was just, God, I've been praying for an opportunity. This is it. Please help me here. And a number of times in Nehemiah, you find almost these sort of little arrow prayers. It says, I've been praying, I've been praying, and you know, now, please God, will you step in? And uh, so it says, I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah, where my fathers are buried, so that I can rebuild it. So he knows what he wants. He's been focused on this prayer. I want an opportunity. Now, actual fact, God, I pray that you will include me in this work, that I can be someone who is significant in uh, this work. And we read, it says, then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, how long will your journey take? And when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me. So I set the time. And I think Nehemiah knew the time. I think Nehemiah had worked out how long would it take me to get back to Jerusalem? I think, and I think this is a really important part, Nehemiah had planned with expectant faith that his prayers would get answered. Because what we find is that as it carries on, I also said to the king, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates, that was the name they gave to the area that uh, Jerusalem was in, so that they will provide me safe conduct when I arrive. So look, I need to be safe. It is it's not safe making this massive long journey back to Jerusalem. But if I have got letters from the king, I know that I will be okay. Uh, so give me these letters of safe conduct. Then he also says, um, and may I have a letter to Asaph, king, keeper of the king's forest, so that he will give me timber to make beams for the citadel, for the gates of the citadel by the temple, and for the city wall, and for the residence I will occupy. 
And so he said, I need resources. We need protection from God. I was mentioning this uh, in our opening prayer uh, when we were looking at the Lord's Prayer. We also need God's provision. And uh, here he was. He, he, had, he wasn't just praying in an abstract way. God, will you just bless me? Will you do something about Jerusalem? He thought, right, OK, um, I need to set a, a work out how long it would take me to get there. I need to ensure that I'm safe. I'm protected. I need to have provisions. I need to have timber from the forest. If we're going to rebuild gates, if we're going to need it to help in the construction of the walls, I, I need somewhere to live myself. I need God to provide for me so that I will be able to carry on and uh, do this work. And I think this is, this is great that he prepares for his prayers to be answered. Um, now, I, I don't think this was, this was an arrogant presumption, though. You see, sometimes I do get a little bit worried when some people talk about faith and they say, well, well I'm just going to believe God and then believe that he's answered and act on that. And uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to pray that I'll win the lottery this week and in faith, I'll go and buy a Mercedes. Even though I haven't won it yet, I'll believe God and uh, I would advise strongly against that. I think that is arrogant presumption because actually faith comes from here in the word of God. It is when we get that conviction within our hearts that God has sent the answer, that the answer is already on the way. Then I believe we can set out. And it's then that uh, we do need to take a risk. Faith almost always involves some sort of risk, but it, it's not, as I said, a, a foolish sort of risk. That I'll just go out, as I said, with arrogant presumption, but I will still wait for God's time. I will wait for that conviction. And at that moment, when the king said, what is it you want, Nehemiah? He praised the God, and I'm sure he thinks, right, okay, the opportunity has come. Now, I mentioned about a risk, and it was a risk, because one of the verses that I mentioned earlier is the king said, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. And I said, the Bible surprisingly said, I was very much afraid. Why was Nehemiah afraid? He was afraid because it was an offense to be sad in the presence of the king. You were not allowed to be sad. I know sometimes when people go uh, to see the queen or maybe in a garden party or if they're receiving an award, they, they get told all the etiquette, how to address her. You call her ma'am, not ma'am, and uh, you don't speak unless you, uh, you're spoken to and all these things. But in Persia in those days, if you were in the presence of the king, you were happy. <laughs> no two ways. It didn't matter how you were feeling. Uh, you had to at least appear to be happy. But as I said, what has happened is that because of Nehemiah's desperation to see God's work flourish, to get involved in that, I think it had just permeated his whole being. And so he is sad because he realizes this is not just an offense. This is a capital offense. You could be put to death for being unhappy in the presence of the king. And so in a very real way, he is risking his life and saying, this is why I'm sad. But actually, I've been praying about this. And uh, thank you, God, here's an opportunity I can now share. I, I, I've planned for my prayers to be answered. I think, uh, I think it would be great if in our prayer meetings, there wasn't so much surprise. It's sometimes when people say, oh, God's answered my prayer, almost with a note of surprise. Wouldn't it be great if the surprises only came if we said, well, God hasn't answered my prayer. Why is that? Am I praying for the wrong thing? Is it not his time? But actually there would be that expectation. Because the Bible, when it talks about faith, I, I know there are some verses in the Bible and uh, they talk about faith. And sometimes we know it says faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. That's in Hebrews chapter 11, and that's verse 1. But actually, I like Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, when it says, when we come to God, we must believe that he, the NIV says, exists. I quite like the authorized version. He is. But God actually is there, right? Um, again, sometimes I think in our ideas, we know God is everywhere, everywhere in general, but sometimes he's nowhere in particular, but actually God is here in particular, is here in my life, is here in your life, is here in our church, is here in our um, community. And the presence of God who is there, it also goes on to say that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. In other words, God will do something about it, but we've got to be diligent. 
you will find me when you search for me with all your heart, when you seek me and search for me with all our heart. Let's be diligent in our prayers. And as I said, God rewards. Um, and what happens is that uh, the king says, yep, that's fine. I'll make sure that you get those letters. I'll make sure that you are protected. I'll make sure that you are provided for, right? But one of the great verses in the Bible says, God is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or think. And uh, what I love about this chapter is that uh, towards the, the end in uh, verse, the end of verse eight and verse nine, Nehemiah says this as well. And because the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted my requests. And then it goes on. It says, so I went to the governors of Trans-Euphrates, this area where Jerusalem is, and gave them the king's letters. The king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. And he hadn't asked for that. He planned it all out. He thought, right, okay, this is what I can ask God for. And it just seems to me that this is part of the bountiful, overflowing grace of God. That uh, God says, okay, you can have the letters, you can have the supplies, but actually I'll let the king send army officers and cavalry with you. Uh, we have not got a God who scrimps and saves. Our God is not a miserly God. It's a great verse in uh, 1 John uh, chapter 3, verse 1, which says, Behold what love the Father has lavished on us. Uh, our God's not short of resources, and he's not short of a willingness to give us those resources, as long as we're using them for his glory, as long as we're seeking him. And he knows that uh, our motivation and our desire is right. And so God comes in and God answers prayer. And so Nehemiah starts off on this journey back to Jerusalem. Uh, we'll pick up the story again, not next week, not next week, we're going to be having our uh, harvest festival, but you know, the week after we'll get back on with this story. But I, I, I would again just encourage you, read these chapters, read about Nehemiah's prayer life, focusing on God and his word and looking for opportunities. Look at his faith, that he is prepared to take a risk, but out of his persistent prayer grows this expectation. He plans that, uh, for what happens when God answers prayer. And of course, God doesn't just answer the prayer. God gives exceedingly more. We have got an abundant God. May, uh, may we just through prayer, through faith, through um, sincere devotion and commitment to God, be able to tap in on his resources and find that indeed his kingdom does indeed start to invade our lives and our families and our church and our community um, and that his will is being done here on earth just as it is in heaven. God bless you all. Amen.